Amen, amen, amen. Book of Isaiah. <clears throat> Chapter 41, chapter 41, and we're going to be reading verses uh, 1 uh, through 9, 1 through 9, verse 1, keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people Renew their strength, let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment. Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings? He gave them as the dust of his sword, and as driven stubble his bow. He pursued them and passed safely even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. The isles saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid, drew near and came. They helped every one his neighbor, and every one said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the carpenter, encouraged the goldsmith and he that smothered with the hammer him that smote the anvil saying it is ready for the soldering and he fastened it with nails that it should not be moved but the but but thou Israel art my servant Jacob whom I have chosen the seed of Abraham my friend notice verse 8 says but after that conversation in 7 about the goldsmiths, silversmiths, carpenters, and stuff. Verse 9, <clears throat> Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men thereof and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee and not, what? Cast thee away. So the first nine verses. In those first nine verses we see the pride of the evil doers they're used to running their mouths because they had not met God nor his judgments. That's the main reason. They heard stories just like Israel used to give stories to their kids about what God used to do. And, uh, and we're seeing with the prophet Isaiah and different things that apparently God was still doing things because remember with Hezekiah, he wiped out that Assyrian army, right? I mean, well, at least 180,000 with one angel, killed the leader and everything. I mean, that's sort of a miracle, and that, that kind of stuff is supposed to go worldwide. People would talk about something like that. But here we're seeing in this verses, it's just, it's just amazing that the pride, just like we have leaders, and the way they talk, and they got no sense, and because their plan is this. There is no God. We're their God. You see? The little people are stupid. We're going to show them how to live. And if there's too many stupid people, hey, attrition is not working fast enough. We have to get rid of a bunch of them. Because we surely don't want them to reproduce. And the next thing you know, they're acting like Hitler, right? Having a super race. And how they get rid of people is wars, disease, uh, maybe even all these years fluoride in the water system. I don't know. Uh, mercury. Uh, how about injections? <laughs> we'll find out. All these guys saying they're going to take this injection before everybody else. Yeah. I'd have to have uh, some, uh, some witnesses that are like from our crowd, that are doctors that, that can make sure that it's the same serum. <laughs> and uh, that, would be, that would be interesting to see what they did then. But anyway, these nine verses, it's, in other words, what I'm saying is people full of pride and arrogance, they don't, they don't really know about God or no God. How in the world can you do that? How can you think you're a God? Well, we can do stuff that's disobedience to God as Christians, and when we do that, we're actually acting like God, but we don't see ourselves as God. If somebody says, well, who's God? We tell them who God is. But we still can act like it. 
even though we're saved people. Well, the world, the world has a better plan. If they don't have God, they got a better plan, they think. And so here in these verses, you're seeing that there's going to be a judgment coming. God's, God presented it and has really told them to uh, start thinking. Uh, God says, shut up. <laughs> Gather your thoughts and let real reality settle in. Uh, you're you're going to be judged on your faithfulness and obedience to righteousness. Back in that day, you either did right or you did wrong. And uh, idolatry is wrong. But when you read those first few verses, you see that it's not, a, it's not really a good thing. That's why you have to read those verses together that we, we read. Now, the islands seem to be mentioned uh, again in chapter uh, 42 a couple times. And uh, then if you do go through the Bible, you know, from Genesis through with islands, you're going to end up in, uh, go to Revelation 6.14. We're talking about isles. Remember we read that in the first few verses? We're only covering nine verses uh, tonight, one through nine in chapter 41 there. But in Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 6. Trust me. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 14. Revelation 6 and verse 14 says, and, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled, uh, rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So the context is when islands is mentioned, you're going to find out going through the Bible, it's got something to do with judgment. I'm not saying all the islands, England, is England there? Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of islands out there. Go to chapter 16 and verse 20 of Revelation. The Bible says, And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And uh, so it has to do with judgment, I'm telling you, whenever you get around them islands, when God's speaking to them, that is. Didn't he create the islands? Yeah, but the people on it are sinners. So the islands themselves weren't doing anything wrong. It was the people on the islands that was doing something wrong. If you remember in Romans there, the book of Romans says that it, nature itself is groaning for the sons of God. They, they want the change. They want the millennium rule. The plants do. <laughs> Go figure. And... Uh, we know in 2 Peter 3.10, go to 2 Peter 3.10, is there's going to be a renovation on this planet. And it has to do with the Lord coming back, second advent. So 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. So there's going to come a time when I guess it's going to be baptized by fire. Then there's new heaven, right? Is that what it says, new earth? New earth, new heaven? And uh, anyway, verse 11 after that, verse that's letting us know what's going to happen in the future it says seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness looking for and hastening on to the coming of the day of God wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat nevertheless we according to his promise look for what new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness so there's going to be coming a baptism of fire. They're talking about global warming. We know that's true, but they don't understand what the global warming is. <laughs> we do. We got Bible on it, chapter and verse. So anyway, we did all that because it mentioned the islands. It's talking about judgment. And uh, so we're letting you know throughout there, it's just, it might be a coinka dink, but I think it's got something to do with something. Apparently, it's got something to do with God and judgment when he mentions islands. 
and he mentions things like this. So that's what we're dealing with in Isaiah here at the beginning. Um, now there's questions. Uh, there are questions that uh, God rhetorically gives in verses 2 to 4. And um, the results of the nations are an end result of his work. And we read verses 2 to 4 again. Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings? He gave them as the dust to his sword, and as the driven, driven stubble to his bow. He pursued them and passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, first and last, I am he. Now, when we look at all that, we see a, a figure there, and I'm telling you, to me, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, just by some of the things it says. I mean, my brain starts clicking in all sorts of different things that he's associated with. When it says going down the path with no feet, no. He's, when he comes down with that horse, I'm telling you, he's just going to be gliding through. I mean, and, and it wouldn't be his feet, it would be hoofs, right? If 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 his horse's hoofs hit hit the ground. But uh, that's just, let me get out of my notes or I'll get off. So, anyway, in verse 2, we read we read the 2 and 4. I said it was rhetorically given because the Lord, it's the Lord that's done it. And in verse 2, this righteous man could be Jesus Christ which would uh, make the majority of this chapter the second advent or uh, or we can try to find uh, a different leader that fits that what God's talking about right we'd have to look to the Gentiles and uh, the only one that that could possibly be uh, would be Cyrus Cyrus at the time and in chapter let's see I'm going to read 45.1 of Isaiah. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him uh, the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. So that would fit these verses too because it has to do with this leader, righteous leader and uh, God chose Cyrus and he put him in charge of those nations and if if you remember Trump is compared with Cyrus over in Israel right now because he helped them to get their temple back and Cyrus had a big deal in that that he favored the Jews if you remember and uh, uh so some of these verses could be historically that. But when you read them, if there's something that sounds like a human cannot do it, then I would, I would highly suggest it's Jesus. Because that's him coming back in the second advent. So can this be taken both ways? Yes, it can be taken both ways. All scripture, right? It can be doctrinal, devotional, and some other ones. Spiritual? Spiritual, practical and uh, doctrine, yeah. So you can spiritualize it if you want. You can do those. We're just looking at what the verse says itself. And right when I first read it, Jesus Christ came to mind. But after reading some of the notes here from Brother Heaton and considering Cyrus 45.1, and then also, let's see, chapter 46 of Isaiah, uh, 11 through 13, The Bible says, uh, make sure I got it. Yep, 46. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Hearken unto me, ye stout hearted that are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. So when I'm looking at that, and I'm seeing like verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times 
the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Then he goes into calling a ravenous bird, singular, from the east. And that could be Cyrus also, calling him a ravenous bird. He comes through and he takes over. Remember how that works with all these nations, you know, Babylon and then uh, Persia? You get, it's just amazing how you see them all flopping around, and but God using all of them. And most of them he used against Israel in one form or another because of their disobedience. So, something to think about. Now we know for a fact that just because we don't understand a passage in our King James Bible, it doesn't mean there's an error. It means God has not revealed it uh, to us yet. So whether that's Cyrus, whether that's the Lord, we can argue about that. Whoever's got the most verses wins, I guess. And, uh, but uh, the fact remains in these verses, what God's trying to tell them is, I do it. See, I put the nations up, I take them down. Yes, the devil's allowed to do all that stuff, use them and conspiracy and facts and all that stuff if I let him. If I don't let him, he ain't doing nothing. And that's what we need to understand. He is the God, little G of this world, but this little God can't move the big God. Big God tells him, go ahead or don't go ahead. He can complain all he wants, but God's still in charge. And thank goodness for that, because we'd be gone already. So, Amen. Verses 6 to 7 in Isaiah there show the attitude of those toward God's judgment. Now, they continue in their idolatrous worship. We see with the goldsmiths, silversmiths, you know, the carpenters will first form it, make it, and the others lay, it, lay the stuff on there, etc. Uh, they're used uh, at, at these, these craftsmen, these skilled men that God give wisdom Special men were used in the temple to work with the gold, the silver, and the brass, and so forth, making different things in the temple. But when they were done doing all that, guess what? You know that they passed the trade down. If you look in the Bible, where else do you find these guys? They're making idols. That's their, <laughs> that's their craft. Okay, you want this? Okay, I'll do it. You know, like making an automobile or something, I guess. I don't know, during that time. But when you, when you look at them, when you see gold, when you see silver, when you see the carpenter work, and you, see, you think about the, uh, uh, the pine trees, the oaks in the Bible, um, the upper areas of the mountains and the hills, the high places, they call it, because it's closer to heaven. They put their idols there. People would go there different hours of the night, different things, depending on their religious some of them would sacrifice their kids or other kids. I mean, it's some weird stuff went on up in the mountains. Everywhere you look, you'll see there'll be a good king, and then all of a sudden it'll say, P.S., he didn't destroy. Right? He never destroyed the what? The high places. And it always messed them up. Why? Because they, they let that continue. See, they figured they'd clean up everything down here, Jerusalem, cities, neighborhoods, but they left that worship up on the mountain that was anti their God. Remember, it's not America. It wasn't like a diverse thing where you were allowed to have that. In, 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 order, to, in order to be faithful to God, you had to be separated. If you were going to be a Gentile, you had to go through the Gentile court. You had to say that you agreed with the only true God of Israel, and you had to obey what he said. That's just the way it is. Or you'd have to find you another country. Or another place to live because you weren't going to be protected by that and 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 you know you you only see actually greece was liberal like that so was rome but still if they wanted to come down on you they would come down on you and take care of you they didn't care about your god because there's like thousands of gods in rome the god was caesar remember yeah and that's almost the way we're going now but you see the attitude of the people. You notice it mentions the gold. It mentions this, uh, the uh, silver. Let me make sure here I'm seeing right. Yep. They helped everyone his neighbor, and everyone said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, because he made the form. You know what I mean? And he that, what? Smothered. 
Is that what it says? Smooth, no, I'm sorry, smoothest with the hammer. Him that smote the anvil, saying, that's the iron worker, right? Somebody works with metals and heat. It is ready for the soldering. So that's him putting things together. And then after they were put together and, you know, formed around there, he fastened it with nails that it should not be moved. So, in in seeing that, I th I should have some verses somewhere. So we know last week what was it, verse nineteen of chapter forty? I got my notes. Yeah, it says the workman melteth the graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold and casteth silver chains. Hmm. What is that? What is that talking about? It's talking about an idol. We covered that last time. And then also, let's see, I have a chapter 46 of Isaiah in verse 6. They lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the balance and hire a goldsmith. And he maketh it a god. Little, That's a good verse there. He maketh it a god. They fall down. Yea, they worship. Okay, it's your gold and silver, right? Then, then let's see, Jeremiah 10.4, you'll like this one. Jeremiah 10.4, can we talk about wood? We talked about the things up there. If, if, you know, you don't have to be very old to grow in the Lord. God will give you, God will, man, he'll double promote you, he'll do certain things. If you want to be his friend, if you want to get together with him, if you want to obey him the best you can, he will He will enlighten you. He will open up doors. Over here, Jeremiah 10, look at verse 4. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers. That it what? Move not. Well, look at verse 3. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the workmen with an axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that not move. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. What is this? An inanimate object that people use to worship. And you know what kind of tree that is. Amen. And then go to Acts chapter 19, 14. Now, if you don't understand something I'm teaching, which could be very possible if I have a burp in my brain or something, you know, as old as I am, you never know, or I confuse it or I don't finish a thought, so write it down. If you write it down, that way you'll remember, you'll say, you know what, this confused me right here. What do you mean there? And then I can try to help you. Because I try to stop enough and just tell you, the reason we're going through these references, we are trying to connect the silversmiths and the goldsmiths and the carpenters with idolatry. we got to figure out why in the world is God talking about all this judgment. See? Because the next verse that we get to, it's about friendship. God's friends. And that one verse almost sounded like everything was going, because it says we'll be encouraged, right? So you got to, when you're looking at the context, you got to say, well, what in the world's going on? Well, what's going on is God's warning of his judgment. And on the other hand, God's saying, the reason this is going on and, and affecting you is because I allow it. See, judgment, I'm God. Allowing it, I'm God. See, everything's pointing to him. They ain't getting the picture is what I'm saying. <clears throat> and all the way in Acts, we're talking about the, the, the smiths and stuff, the idolatry. Let's see. You got Acts 19? Acts 19. In verse 14, and there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and, is that the one? Yeah, okay, and, and chief of the priests, which did so. Did, did so? What did they do? Hmm. Certain of the 13 says, certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. 
And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? I think the best person to do that is an old school black man. Read that verse. Because they read it so good. And what was going on? Somebody had an evil spirit. Somebody wanted the power of what Paul had, right, for just having the power. And I'm trying to get the connection between that. Let me see. Silver, gold, Acts 19, 14. For a certain man named Demetrius a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana. You're probably right. That's probably right, because I got 14. So on the tape, just go 1924. Because this is just supposed to be a verse uh, adding to the other verses about what goldsmiths are doing on their time off after they didn't do anything for Solomon's house or his temple. <laughs> They're doing this for a living. Okay? So you got that, right? That's pretty simple. All right. Now we'll go to verse 8. Verse 8 of 41. Talking directly to Israel, right? But thou, Israel, art my servant. Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham. What? Seed of Abraham my friend so it's like going backwards it's like first you got Abraham God's friend right then you got Jacob correct and then his name was changed to Israel so God's starting present you know talking about the nation of Israel everybody knows who Jacob is and then he stops and he says oh by the way Abraham my friend Abraham's my friend you say, well, it doesn't, sort of like doesn't look like that. It looks like, let me look at that again. It says, the seed of Abraham, my friend. So that makes his seed his friend. Right? I mean, you could take it that way, but that ain't what it means. It means Abraham's his friend. And therefore, his seed is what God protected as a friend of Abraham. Guess what? If you're a friend of my father's, you're a friend of mine. You ever hear that? Now you say you're going to prove that right? You know, I'm going to try to prove it right. I really am. Go to James chapter 2. Book of James chapter 2. You know why it's so hard to believe in God? You can't see him. <laughs> Duh. He's not physically there. So you have to ex experience him how? Spiritually. You got to understand his presence. You do something wrong, guess what? You feel bad. Why is that? Conscious. Who's working in your conscience? The law. The law is working in your conscience. <laughs> anyway, you have uh, James chapter 2. Lord willing, I got the right verse. Chapter 2, let's see, how about verse 23 with Abraham? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the what? friend of God. So no matter how you construe something in verses other than scripture with scripture, to God he was his friend. I mean that's what I got out of that. He was called the friend of God. If somebody went, the priest went or something and started talking to God about, well you know Abraham he's all my friend. No, you go to him and say, Abraham was your friend. <laughs> I'm his kid. <laughs> I'm his grandkid. I'm his great grandkid. Remember? That's your friend. So I'm petitioning you <laughs> for mercy because of your friend Abraham. <clears throat> and there's a lot of types there because Abraham is a type of God the Father. Did you know that, Michelle? Yeah, Abraham's a type of God the Father 
Well, who would be God the Son? Isaac. And Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice him, his father. And Isaac had the wood on his back because he had to start the fire. So he carried the wood up there. And then when they got there, guess what? He says, see, there's no sacrifice. Abraham says, yes, there is. You're the sacrifice. Like Jesus, you know? And then all of a sudden, a voice came, right? And said, there's a ram caught in the thicket. So he was able to spare Isaac. Right? Spare Isaac. But Isaac was the sacrifice, intended sacrifice. So the typology of that is, you got God the Father, you got God the Son. Now, Michelle, don't end there, see? Don't end there. Don't end there. He gets older. I don't know how many, I don't know how many years older. I have to look at that. I wonder if it's 33. I have to look at that. Isaac. Anyway, he's got to get a bride, right? Isaac's got to get a bride. You got Bible. I'm picking on Michelle. Should pick on Lily. Wake up, Lily. You know what I'm talking about? Amen. And uh, so he sends Ebenezer. Ebenezer is a servant. All right? Servant. And what is his job? To look for a bride. For who? Isaac. So that makes that makes Ebenezer the Holy Spirit. God the Father's Abraham. God the Son's Isaac. Isaac needs to get a bride. Sends the servant, the Holy Ghost, to go look for one. Right? Goes through a bunch of stuff, but she had to agree. And when she agreed, what was her name, Rebecca? I think. Remember that? She agreed. And you know what that what else that servant had? Loaded her with treasures. Loaded her with treasures. Blessings. Because she made the decision to be the bride of Isaac. And so, way over where she was, she got on a camel. Right? Because that's how they traveled. And the camel's name was, you know what? Grace. So Rebecca got on the camel named Grace led by Ebenezer, type of the Holy Spirit, and took her to her future husband, Isaac. And when she saw him afar off, she lit off the camel, Grace, and went in the tent with him and forever they lived, right? That's a picture of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And it's a picture of us in the Old Testament. And it's a picture of grace, because that's how you get wherever you go. It's the grace of God. I like it. And guess what? I learned that a long time ago. And the person that preached that got it off a book that was written probably in the 1800s or 1700s. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying when you read this Bible, it ain't just text after text. It's God's words. And if you treat it like that, he speaks to your heart. Would it really be good for Michelle and look up everywhere that's got something to do with art? You know, drawing paintings or something. See, see what's in there. And uh, if God wants you to do that, you know what? If you, if you found nothing but negative scriptures on, like, say, art, because maybe it's referring in the Bible to like Egyptian art or these weird paintings that you shouldn't be looking at, like pornography paintings and all that stuff. But that's what they had back then. They just didn't have our technology. And uh, he says, no, don't look at it. Don't have it in your house, you know. Well, that doesn't cut out the artistry. See, artistry is a gift. And if you like it in your heart, then you should develop it. God will let you develop it. But you got to do it for his glory. See, it's not about these guys growing up and all of a sudden next thing you know they're doing Stephen King movies and stuff and sketching all the, the, the glorious demons of, you know. 
I don't believe uh, that's what God gave you a talent for. Talent is to glorify Him. That's why your preachers, uh, uh, what would you call that? A realist when it comes. You got surrealists, you got uh, abstractors, you got, uh, you know, the Picasso things, um, cubism, all different kinds of, of designations by uh, for certain artistry work that you do. To me, I think the hardest thing is life. I think when you can capture that picture of the bark going in the right way, of the sun coming through the exact where it's supposed to, you know, and I mean, it looks like that. To me, that's that's your degrees of how good you can do something by making it that close. Just realism. Uh, that can be boring sometimes, I guess. But uh, does that mean you can't do any other kind of art? No, you can do all the art you want. But to me, the difficult part, and people argue with that because there's different ways of doing the other art that's pretty difficult too. But I'm just saying, the whole conversation is like this. Whatever you got, if you got a talent, God will allow you to develop it, but you got to remember that it's Him. Therefore, you give Him glory. You're not going to use your talents, you know, for the dark arts or to support anything demonic. I mean, why would you do that if you believe God gave you that talent, see? And, but it goes along the line with everything else, you know, killing babies and the whole shot, not natural affection. So anyway, said all that because of James 2.23, we got into the friend of God, right? And there's the, the Jew also, because of that covenant with Abraham and God, has they have special privileges. And uh, it's 8.05 now, but they do have special privileges. And let me give you the verses. How's that? Uh, Second uh, Chronicles 20 and verse 7. And then we see, and we're talking about the friend now, friend of God. And uh, we'll, uh, uh, so that may be Second Chronicles, yeah, 27 may, uh, I'm confused myself now. Anyway, you got Second Chronicles 27. And then for Moses, the friend and all that, Exodus 33, 11. Exodus 33, 11, and also Numbers 14, 11 through 20. Now, we covered some of that. I don't know if it was in Sunday school, but it seems familiar to me. I told you how, uh, oh, that was uh, how God puts men in charge. And so we're into the Apostle Paul now, Sunday school on Sunday. Remember the Paul, the man, the calling of uh, God, that God chooses men? And we went through the verses on Moses where people questioned that. And eventually what happened was the ground opened up and they all went down to hell. <laughs> God, God showed them who was in charge. So, and also we know that our beloved Paul was unique. And he's definitely different from Barnabas, Timothy, and Peter, etc. Special place in God's heart for Paul when you read the scriptures. So, now I do not say that God has no other friends. But what I do say is, According to scripture, you know, the designation of friend with God is Abraham and Moses. Abraham and Moses. Now look at John 15, 14. John, Gospel of John 15, verse 14 says this. Ye are my friends, comma, if you do whatsoever I command you. I've had people use that verse on me, holiness people saying, see, not a friend of God, you're going to die and go to hell. I had briders, Baptist briders that believe it started with Jesus, you know. And if you don't believe that, then guess what? You're a friend of the bride, but you're not the bride. It's unbelievable the different doctrines. Now, you never heard of this before, probably never will. I'm throwing it out there, so if something ever happens in your mind, you'll say, you know, preacher did mention something like that, some goofy stuff. This does not say you're losing your salvation. It does not say that. It says friendship. So this right here has to do with obedience. And to have friends, you show yourself friendly. So by obeying our Father... We show him, we want him as a friend. Friendship with the world is enmity 
with God. So that's that's some. I, I just think. <laughs> I just think most. If you're saved, you just about already know all the things that's going to mess you up with the judgment seat of Christ. The deep things sometimes that we get into strengthen us, you know, give us some meat. We forget about those little things. And uh, I, I think that's going to be the main thing that we're going to be judged for in our motive. What sort it is means you're either selfish or you're serving him. Everything's for you or you're doing stuff for Jesus, period. And uh, verse 9, the last of that in our study. It shows, like we, like we were talking about, a special place. Israel has uh, had a special treatment from God as no other nation on earth. Uh, go to Deuteronomy 4. Way back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4, boy, it's got a lot of verses. Deuteronomy 4 and uh, verses 7 and 8. For what nation is there so great? Who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments uh, so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day. Well, you don't have to read the whole chapter, but what nation do you think he's talking about? Israel. And if you look, he added that little obedience because he put the law, he put the statutes, he put the judgments in there. But if you look at it, he, they get special treatment if you haven't read your Bible yet. Uh, I'll do a few verses, then I'll just tell you verses. Exodus chapter 6. Okay, Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And then Exodus 19. Exodus 19, verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. Talk about prejudice. You see that? Above all people. Man, I wonder why people don't like this Bible. How about Leviticus? Exodus Leviticus. 26. So, Michelle, when you hear anybody talking bad about the Jew, you can talk bad about bad Jews, right? A lot of bad Jews, just like anybody else, individuals. But that nation of Israel, you better be careful. Leviticus 26. Just the fact that Biden and all the boys are already trying to ruin that accord. They said it out loud. They're, they're exing themselves. So over here in, in Leviticus 26 and verse 12, and I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be what? My people. Now believe it or not, there's hundreds of verses like this when you go from Genesis all the way through to Revelation showing that God is partial to Israel. And that is the nation of Israel. And the people in it that obey him, the others, he treats them like, uh, uh, I guess he'll chasten them. He'll do what he has to do with them and eventually annihilate them if they don't listen. And usually when you're doing a study like in Isaiah here, there's a couple other verses. Deuteronomy 7, 6, if you're writing them down. I'm sorry. Psalm 33 and uh, verse 12. And Psalm 94, verse 14. Besides Isaiah, 41, 1 through 9. But, uh, 
So all tonight in Isaiah, all we're doing you, doing for you is we're showing you that there could be two applications to the verses. Some of the verses, most of the verses are Second Advent. That's a thou- Whenever a preacher says Second Advent, that means the Lord reigning on planet Earth for a thousand years. Him reigning is the Second Advent. Okay? Rapture is before the tribulation period. We go up. We get out of here. After the tribulation period, he takes over. And during the tribulation time, certain things are going to take place there. So when you look at the judgment of God in the Old Testament, and it talks about the sun, the moon, talks about things that haven't happened yet, but by cross-referencing, you end up over there in the tribulation, or you mark it down. It's a prophecy about what's going on in the tribulation. It's looking forward. If you can, like we did tonight with that uh, ruler, there's a few verses that could make him Cyrus. And because of the context historically of the book of Isaiah, you know, the time has taken place, who the kings are going to be, you know, like we got in, in Ezekiel there. Hez- yeah. Ezekiel? No, no. Hezekiah. And uh, all the different things that are taking place with who he was dealing with. Next step is Babylon, and then boom, you're dealing with Cyrus, right? So it's coming down, and you would think, you would think that, uh, I like using Michelle anyway. All of a sudden, Michelle's going home, and she gets a call on her cell phone. Don't go there. Something bad's going on. You know, we'll just say, I'm just saying. Somebody's warning you that you know that you trust. Now, for you to go there anyway, well, you just told the person that you love or whoever it is that you trust that they're lying. And number two, you'll suffer something that you wouldn't have had to suffer because you didn't listen. And so Israel and us, when God says don't, it means don't. And we don't listen. And then sometimes you get away with stuff for a little length of time. And then boom, something happens. Then you say, man, you admit it. You say, oh, man, I know. But you see, if you wouldn't have did it the first time, if you listened the first time, it would have been a lot better on you, wouldn't it? I mean, that should be sense. When you don't do that with God, you don't do that with anybody. And that's our nation right now. All them kids growing up, all them generations growing up hating America. What? In the world? All those kids growing up with all those uh, games and everything else they play on TV. And then they hear the news and they see kids over there getting blown up and everything every day. And they, it don't even dawn on them it's not happening here. Or why? Next thing you know, they march with the communists. But it starts with the church. And the message that the church was given, not with the country. Because the country started right. Started right with the Holy Spirit and the Bible, not a pope. Nowhere to be found. That's why they left Europe, because of the pope. <sighs> Amen. So happy, happy night. Uh, tonight, before you go to bed, pray for Mark that, uh, you know, he gets enough sleep. He gets in tomorrow. He's getting in there almost uh, 1255. i got to go pick him up from Metro. And uh, amen. And that we have friends come show up hopefully uh, Thursday and Friday. And uh, pray for God to provide. That's all I know. And if you guys hear anything about anybody, I don't care who it is, Michelle, let me know. Call me up or text me. You know, if you find out anything, you know. That'll help me.